Today's episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast is sponsored by Web Healer. You're a counselor in private practice and you need a website, or you've got an existing website which you need help with. Web Healer are offering Counseling Tutor Podcast listeners, that's you, £100 off the cost of a website design and build. Now, Web Healer specialise in websites for counsellors and psychotherapists. It's what they do. And the Web Healer team provide a completely non technical, done for you solution, leaving you to focus your time on your clients. Operating for 20 years, Web Healer are a trusted resource amongst counsellors when it comes to getting your practice online. So get the package details and claim your £100 off coupon for your new website by going to counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. That's counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor podcast. The must listen to podcast for counsellors, psychotherapists and counselling students. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory and welcome to episode 281 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Today we're thrilled to have a remarkable guest with us, Sassy Smith. Sassy is the founder of the Aphantasia Academy and shares her insights on one specific area of neurodivergence aphantasia the inability to visualize so stay till the end to hear her fascinating insights welcome it's episode 281 as rory has said three stops on today's journey rory's already spoken about what we're doing in practice matters with sassy smith but uh, preceding that we're going to be looking at our student services where we revisit those important counseling fundamentals it's back to the basics and then we're going to be going into our ethical sustainable practice where we're going to be having a look at what happens when you're running a practice you have cancellations you have no shows what do we do and then of course into that all-important guest lecture from sassy smith in practice matters rory yes absolutely and we start with <clears throat> counseling fundamentals and i was mindful the other day i was supervising a really really experienced therapist and she was saying that she was getting into a little bit of a muddle on how to work with a work with a client. And I said, let's go back to fundamentals. And, you know, if you're a student listening to this, it's really, really good practice just to get the fundamentals right. Even experienced therapists um, benefit from just returning to the fundamentals and just, just sticking with the, the, if you like, the helping model, the skills model. And the fundamentals are really um, very basic things like timekeeping. You know, if you're, <clears throat> you know, if you're going to meet somebody, so maybe you're recording a skills session or maybe you're recording a fitness to practice, make sure you give yourself a little bit of time before you actually, you know, sit down in front of that person. Make sure you ground yourself. At the end of the podcast, we always say, I always say, stay grounded. And stay grounded is about, finding that space around you, finding that ability to be able to put everything else out of your mind, what's going on in the day, and just start to focus on what you're going to be doing, that I-thou connection, you and the person in front of you. And then moving on from that, I think being attentive, you know, that, that attentive part of it is really, really important. You know, you're, you're, you're seeing the person, they're sitting in front of you, you know, you're you're honouring them by giving by giving the space, giving the time, allowing them to speak, and you know, I think it just those two fundamentals, Ken, are just so important in building the right environment for someone to start to speak about what's going on for them in a in a in a place that feels natural and and really corrects, if you like. Yeah, very, so, so important. And it's interesting you referred to like a qualified practitioner revisiting those fundamentals. But I also recognize that as a student, specifically early steps into placement, um, 
it may bring up anxiety. It may bring up of what do I do? What skills am I going to use here? And I think coming back to these fundamentals, back to these basics, it gives you a really strong foundation. If all you do is follow the fundamentals that Rory and I are covering here, you will create that environment for therapeutic growth within the session. So it's kind of less about what skill should I put in here? What am I supposed to say when the client says this? And just going and looking at what underpins, what creates that therapeutic relationship? What are the ingredients, as it were? And you've said time keeping Rory and and timekeeping is interesting because we have the timekeeping within the session which is more of a boundary but what you're referring to Rory is having the time to change gears maybe between clients maybe before the client comes in to be able to prepare yourself to become I guess not uh, uh, caught up in what might have gone before that checking your emails just before a client comes in, seeing something Mm -hmm. that is urgent that you need to attend to and that maybe being in your mind as the client comes in is not timekeeping in in benefit of of the uh, of of the client coming in and of course being attentive as you've just said and then we go on to what is very often considered a skill and it is active listening it is don't just listen here and this is so so important you know so often we can be tempted into thinking how do i respond correctly to what the client is saying what's the right skill to pop in here but so much more important than that is truly hearing that person not just the words that they're saying how are they presenting what is their body language what are their eyes where where is their eye uh, darting to or are they avoiding eye contact how are their hands are they wringing their hands looking at the whole of that person and with that we don't just hear the words we hear what is referred to as the music behind those words we're seeing the person and hearing the person actively within the environment in their entirety and the skills are natural from there they flow naturally just reflecting back just a few words of what that client says shows that we are actively listening but we wouldn't just take narrative words that are meaningless out of the middle of the sentence if we're truly listening if we're really hearing them we will be reflecting back the emotional words that that client brings. And then I guess another uh, a skill um, that is, <laughs> is an interesting one because, again, there is a tendency in, in, in day-to-day living to fill silence. We have words like, oh, and then there was this uncomfortable silence. We can all recognize maybe a time of uncomfortable silence, but within that therapeutic environment, these fundamentals, the very basics, silence is your friend. If you don't know what to say, saying nothing is usually the best bet in that situation. (laughs) And silence is incredibly powerful within a counseling relationship. So we've just been listening or really hearing that client Allowing silence for for the weight of the words, for the weight of what they've just brought is is just so appropriate in those fundamentals. And then, of course, Rory, I'm going to bat this back to you as I say, we want to wrap those core conditions around that that we're discussing right now. Yes, absolutely. And and we use the core conditions. It's it's a it's a well-known shorthand for Roger's ideas of therapeutic helping of which three are facilitative. The sixth really are six conditions, but we we talk about three, which really are facilitative, empathy, congruence, and unconditional positive regard. And I like that term wrapping, wrapping the skills we've talked about before or the the ways of being we've discussed before around using the the, the core conditions. And being empathic, and I think being empathic is trying to see the world through the eyes of the client when we met all the person you're working with it could be you know you could be doing a skill session um and trying to see the world through their eyes and that means putting our frame of reference to one side the way we view the world to one side and tuning in so it's being attentive hearing listening and and trying to get a sense of what it is like to be that person mm, yeah and <clears throat> that takes a lot of skill because we spend so much time listening to our own internal dialogue 
and our own internal clock that ticks away all the time when we when we're awake. And you have to kind of put that on pause, pop it to one side, and tune into someone else's internal clock and someone else's um way of seeing the world. And with that, one of the fundamental things is putting onto one side your own kind of judgments of how you live your life, how you might view your life, and listening to how they view their experience of life. Mm. And again, it's a kind of putting yours onto one side. And and also being congruent, being real. You know, I think that, you know, many years ago I listened to someone who, who gave a dazzling, dazzling display of counselling skills. However, the challenge for this person was that she needed to be herself. She needed to be real. She needed to be the, the, the person who she was, not a professional helper, but just that person. I'll call her Helen. It wasn't, she wasn't called Helen, but just to be Helen, because that's so important to, you know, using counseling skills is not about being a professional inverted commas. It's about one person listening to another. And the challenge is, you be that person, you be yourself. And if you go back to those fundamentals again and again and again, you will find that the client is able to be their self and talk about what's going on for them. And by hearing their own voice and by being able to put out their own internal dialogue into the world, they'll be able to start that process of looking at themselves. And I guess that development of moving their lives forward, it's, fundamentals is just so important Ken. they are and and i love how you've kind of phrased that and i love how you've spoken about congruence and it's interesting i remember my early steps into counseling practicing skills with peers i was sitting playing the part of a counselor i was being a professional clinician in my mm. mind and i was ignoring who i really was and you know the the through the arc of training we do a lot of personal development and that personal development hopefully will show you that your biggest asset you listening to this your biggest asset that you have is who you are you bring your uniqueness to the counseling room you set yourself apart from any other counselor that that client may see because you are you we don't need to try and be like anybody else we just be our true selves and roger says towards the end of his uh, uh, life in his work he was saying you know he, he looks and the more he is truly himself and this is uh, over the arc of, uh, of decades of work he found that clients were more able to 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 um to to move to to kind of i guess feel the, the power of that and, and uh, develop within that relationship. And it's really interesting. I, I listen to those things very, very carefully because here's a man who spent uh, a lot of his life studying counselling and coining those phrases of the uh, facilitative uh, conditions or, or the necessary and sufficient conditions if we take all of them together, all six of them together. So that congruence, very, very important, and as are, of course, those core conditions as we've used the name for it. And then I guess... Just as we come to the end of this, meeting the client where they are, mm. working at their pace. How does this client talk? Do they speak quickly? Do they get to uh, jump from one place to another? Or are they slow? Are they reserved? Do they need time to think? So looking at the pace that the client is setting and being where they are. And, and maybe an example of this is you may have a client who within a session – presents and and brings a key aspect of what they're struggling with or what challenge they may be facing within that session and right at the end of the session that client may even say you know what I might even go away and think about this and bring it next time well perhaps they will perhaps they won't that is their choice meeting the client where they are 
is allowing the space for that client to perhaps not bring that the next time they visit. They've got a, maybe a week that has passed. They might have other challenges or other things that are important to them to focus on in that moment. Now, we can, of course, refer to saying, I know last time you, when we were checking out, you mentioned such and such, but I wonder where you find yourself today and what it is you want to bring today. So like laying out the invite and recognizing what did come before, but allowing the client to be where they are, not where we go. But last time you finished saying that we were going to talk about this. So let's talk about this. <laughs> Let them set the pace. And then I guess uh, just to kind of bring this to an end, we're going to summarize uh, these fundamentals in a moment. And it keys into the next point, which is to summarize at the end. And a summary is such a useful way of bringing a session to an end. I always think about it as uh, wrapping a little present for the client, recapping the, the arc of the session, touching on the emotional points, the things that resonated with that client, the things that you could see and sense by being there with them were important to them. Maybe they had a moment of movement. We can focus on that. Maybe they recognize there is a challenge. We can wrap that up and, and just summarize the arc of the, of the session. So often when we're in the moment, and we're, we're going through what we're saying, we can kind of lose track of what might have been said 10 minutes ago. Now, as a therapist, we're there listening. We are attentive. We're really paying attention. So we get to hold that picture for the client. We get to paint it for them as they are leaving it, as we saw it. And you can leave a little bit of a, a, a gap on the end because this is as we saw it. Remember, this is our frame of reference as best we can, trying to put it over in the client's frame of reference, saying how it was for them. But we can say, so we kind of summarize and then say, so that's kind of how it felt for me. I wonder how that feels for you. And handing that summary over like I say, is a little gift for them to take away. But it also gives an opportunity for the client to go, no, actually, you know what? I'm thinking about that now. It, it, it didn't actually feel like that. And it gives them an opportunity to kind of maybe set us right if we're outside of their frame of reference. And sometimes that summary can be really, really useful. It might be something that the client may take away. And we know that the processing from counselling, yes, it does happen within the counselling room, but it happens also as the client leaves and as they go into their life and in the following week and sometimes even in the following years, something that was said, something that was handed over will be processed, fall into place and cause a moment of movement for a client. So the importance of that summary, um, absolutely powerful at the end when we revisit the, the fundamentals. And we close this, Rory, by kind of recognising that when we study counselling, when we go in, it might feel like so much to learn, so much to know, all of the skills, all of the theory, all of the practice and the ethics and all of that. But at the end of the day, there are seven fundamentals that we've covered today. Timekeeping, being attentive, not just listening, but really hearing. Silence, being your friend, the use of those core conditions, meeting that client where they are and the summary that wraps that up that I think really encapsulates pretty much when I look at my own past practice, about 90% of the work that I did in <laughs> counselling, Rory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ken. And, and I think that's why, that's why going back to fundamentals and just using those fundamentals is so important because that basically is the model. And one final thought is that we're not after a perfect counselling skills session because there isn't a perfect counselling skill session. What we're after is somebody who is working really hard to see the, the person or the, you know, the, the speakers, as it's sometimes referred to in class, frame of reference, who is really trying to um, see, see the, the world as they are. So if, you, if you're going into a skill session and you think it should be perfect, pop that out in your mind. Go with the fundamentals and you'll find the magic happens. Get the seven points written down in a handout. It's called Counselling Fundamentals. It's free. It's for you. Where do you get it? 
Simple. Go to counsellingtutor.com, click on the podcast tab, make your way to episode 281, today's podcast. You can download that free of charge, print it out, have it on hand, revisit this, discuss it with your peers. It is one of Rory's super duper handouts. Student Services is sponsored by Counselling Skills Academy. Have you ever wondered if you're using counselling skills effectively? confidentiality means we rarely see skills used by others so it's no wonder that so many students say they lack confidence in their counseling skills that's why i built counseling skills academy counseling skills academy is an online course that you can do at your own pace it will give you the skills competence and confidence to know that you're using your skills most effectively You will see real counselling skills used by a counsellor in real life sessions covering everything from how risk is assessed right through to working towards an appropriate ending. Visit counsellingskillsacademy.com to learn more and to claim your counselling tutor discount. That's counsellingskillsacademy.com. We're kind of back out of our student services and we park ourselves happily and comfortably into our ethical, sustainable practice. This is where we kind of acknowledge that starting, building, growing a private practice is not taught at any great depth within our core training. There are new skills that we need to to gather, and this section is dedicated to you, the private practitioner. And today we wanted to speak about cancellations, clients that don't show up, and your payment policies, Rory? Yes, absolutely. And we we refer to ethical sustainable practices, ESP. And when when we talk about ESP, this is what we call the sustainable part of it, because sustainable means sustaining you as a therapist. You are paid to do work. You know, you, you, you set yourself up as a private practitioner. And part of that is that at the end of the week, you have enough money to buy your groceries and to, to live your life and, and pay your bills. And if someone cancels and doesn't pay, um, then what happens is, is that you are, you are, you are in deficit of that. You don't have that money. And I think can, you know, both of us are probably sat in our, in our practice rooms and a client, hasn't attended or they phone up you know 10 minutes before they're due to show up and say oh something's happened you know childcare issues and and that's fine you know you know life goes on around therapy you know and there's some things that the clients are more important than coming to therapy but it does speak to <clears throat> how do we manage that in terms of our finances and what i do in my contract well when i practiced was i had a cancellation ag- agreement where if someone cancelled um, in less than 24 hours, then the full fee was payable. And, you know, a lot of people might say, well, that's a bit harsh. They're not getting the counselling, but they're paying. But they're paying for my time. I have then, I have when I set that hour aside, another client who might want that hour has been told, well, you, you might have to come later or next week. I've set that, that time aside. So it's really, really important and you know that is in my contract there are different ways of protecting your income a cancellation policy is one and another is that you know some colleagues of mine charge for two sessions in advance so um, the first per- the first time they come the client comes they pay for two sessions and then the next session they'll pay for another two and what happens is if the client doesn't turn up um that that fee that's been paid in advance is the cancellation fee. So it's really important to think about um, your fee structures, but in particular, how are you going to collect it if the client doesn't show care? Yeah, this comes down to self-care for me. You know, I, I love how you wrap this in ESP, ethical and sustainable practice, and looking at that sustainability. You know, you, you, you study, you put all the work in, you set up a private practice, you are there offering that service. And uh, you deserve to be paid a fee for the time that you set aside to see that client. And if you look uh, to other services, so if I was to uh, book a cinema ticket for this evening, and I book it online and and I make a payment, but I'm then not able to go for whatever reason, well, they're going to just keep that seat open. 
and I uh, that's it. I've paid for that seat. Uh, the fact that I couldn't be there, they have still kept that seat open. And it's the same for you as a counsellor. If you're keeping that hour open, that therapeutic time open for that client, and you're protecting it, it's a held space for that client, then you deserve to be paid for that time even if that client chooses not to arrive for whatever reason that may be. And I think you don't have to think for very long. Uh, you can have a, a long list of other services or professions where it will be the same. You will pay and uh, it is then your responsibility to arrive and show up. You mentioned, Rory, um, the uh, uh, that some colleagues of yours. <laughs> and uh, of course, that was how I managed my practice. And this was given mm. to me by my supervisor, because when I first went to supervision, I needed to pay two supervision sessions on my first time. And, and uh, when I was looking at my practice and setting that up, we looked at that a little bit more in depth. And I chose that as a way of working within my practice that and it was covered in my contract. And we'll get to that in a moment, because this is all about uh, cancellations, no shows, and the most important part, your payment policies. We're going to get there in a mo. So my payment policy was, and written in my contract, and agreed with the client as they arrived that they would pay twice for the first session. It gives them a session in hand. It means, and this is the wording I would use with with my clients. I would say to them. This kind of covers for any no-shows because you would need to, to, to pay for that if you don't give at least 24-hour notice. And, of course, we'll, we'll revisit that when we go into the policies, what yours might be. Uh, but one of the benefits for you, the client, is that on your last session, when you feel this is the end for you and it's your last session, the best part is you don't have to pay on that last session. Mm. And that was a very positive way of me putting that over and explaining to clients. And I never had a question on it not once but i did have some no-shows throughout the years mm -hmm. but i was always covered for that time that i had put aside for that client and that is that sustainability within your practice and why did i say that self-care because so often we can look at what we do as a service which it is we can do it because we want to make a difference in the lives of others which so many of us do but we Self-care in the lessons I learned says we have to look to self first. We have to be okay to be there for our clients. If we're a little bit aggravated by a previous client who came and didn't pay, how might it be when we see them again? Are we a little bit mm, about that? What are we carrying within ourselves perhaps how might it be when we see our next client and the previous one didn't come and we didn't get paid for that but we put the side away i'm mean, getting cross just thinking about it Rory. of course i'm parodying this and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of animating it <laughs> but you will be able to see and find your way and where you sit within that but the most important part whichever way you choose to do this it is an agreement it is a policy and it needs to be written down and needs to be covered within your contracting period, so in that pre-first session or the beginning of that first session, so that it is understood by you, that it is understood by the client. So if you were working that a payment of a session needs to be made, whether they're there or not, you would need to outline exactly what that looks like, why it is in place for you, because you're putting that time aside for them and you will hold it. And then, of course, we do understand that things do happen and life does get interrupted quite significantly mm -hmm. for some uh, and maybe you have a time li limit on that maybe it is you need to let me know 24 hours before if you're not going to be able to attend and and then at least that gives you opportunity within your practice to reallocate that place uh, some choose 48 hours and of course that would be up to you others will choose uh, to uh, ask for payment for six sessions in advance. And if the person doesn't at attend for two of those, well, when they get to the end of what would have been the six sessions, they're asked to pay again. And it, it, I, I think it's about you looking what fits for you uh, and separating it from the pureness of that making a difference and being there in service of clients. We have to look to self-care first to make sure that we're okay and the analogy of that of course that I learned during studying under you Rory was that if you're in an airplane that airplane loses pressure within the cabin and the little oxygen masks drop down the instructions are put on your own mask first 
so that mm. you can have oxygen and be there and available to be there for those others that you may then help. And I guess sustainability in practice is of utmost importance. When you can't pay your bills, when the money's not coming in, that can cause uh, anxiousness. It, it can cause good practitioners to to leave counselling because they're not able to make those ends meet. And then we're not there to be able to help the others, Rory. Yes, absolutely, Ken. And, and the other thing is, is that the, the world goes on around you. So I can I can remember when I was practicing, someone cancelled on me and I thought, okay, well, I've got, you know, now I've got an hour to um, just do something else. Maybe I'll do some CPD. Maybe I'll read a book. Maybe I'll just make myself a pot of tea and look out of the window. I have to say that sounds, that sounds like a jolly good idea. And um, I forgot to cancel the room. And guess what? I had to pay £10 for an empty room and no client had come. So, you know, your bills keep rolling in, your supervision bills, your insurance bills, yeah. your professional body bills, um, you know, your CPD bills, they keep running in. And I think it comes down to the fact that, you know, we use we use the word business with a small b. You're running a, a, a small business being a self-employed therapist and you have to have kind of business savvy about you. And part of that is making sure that your income stream is is consistent. And you know what, Ken? This comes up so many times in our Facebook group, people asking this same question, what, what are your no-show policies? What are your cancellation policies? Yeah. And, of course, if you want to join our Facebook group, I'm sure that listeners who have been listening for a long time will know this by now. But if you happen to be new and you don't know, then just go to Facebook, Counselling Tutor, and uh, knock on the door and we'll let you in. And uh, you can see all the, all the interesting conversations that go on. But it's really, really important that to sustain yourself and you know to pay your bills that you have a a cancellation and a no-show policy and you know it may feel counterintuitive but at the end of the day as ken said you have to look after yourself to look after others yeah and it's interesting again maybe this is not something that's taught during formal counseling studies and maybe a, a way of me kind of evidencing that for myself as you mentioned the facebook group rory i've seen over the years many frustrated posts on the Facebook, mm. uh, uh, in, within that Facebook group about um, uh, practitioners that have had uh, somebody that maybe did not arrive and they're quite frustrated about it. And, that, and, and it is then that they go to that consideration of maybe I need to work out some kind of a, a, a payment policy around how I work with this because they're out of pocket. And you can, you can feel the frustration in some of those, those posts. And I guess that's what this podcast is about. It's about speaking about the what's going on. As Rory and I say, we're not the experts. We're just two peers having a discussion about topics that come up. Um, and uh, it's something maybe to consider now. If you don't have a payment policy, you don't have a, cancel, a cancellation policy uh, in, your, in your practice and, and, and in your contract, maybe consider that. Maybe have a chat with some colleagues and see how that is. Maybe go and have a chat with your, your supervisor mm -hmm. and see how that may may look. Is it time to revisit your policy if you do have a policy? Does it still work for you? Is it robust uh, through the years? So there it is. That is today's ethical, sustainable practice, looking at your cancellations, no-shows, and your payment policies. And just before we leave it, if you are a student and you're not yet out um, receiving payment, um, you undoubtedly within your placement hours that you will no doubt be giving freely uh, to get the experience, going to experience those cancellations and no shows. And Rory gave just a little hint and we'll, we'll maybe cover it in another uh, uh, podcast topic. I know we have covered it in the past. Little hint. You know, if, if you're going to an agency and your client is not arriving, you don't have... Uh, the luxury of having a, a payments policy. You are there in service mm. and you're gaining your hours. But what you can do is take your textbooks, take your assignment work with you and have it in a bag. And I know I had mine because I had my 
fair share of uh, no shows when I was doing my placement hours. I think it was for every four uh, shows, I'd at least have one or two sometimes no shows. Um, but I had my work there and I would take it out and work on my assignment or reread up on what we'd just covered or read up on what we were going to go into. So be prepared uh, as a student. Maybe you can't rely on that policy, but you can, of course, prepare for no shows that way as well. Yes, I absolutely can. And, you know, for, for those of you who have maybe just stepping out of, um, you know, first training and into your 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 practice you're making a living out of it now um some of these areas such as you know having a, a cancellation no show and payment policy may be new information because they, they're certainly not taught at you know at, at a lot of uh training establishments they're interested in training you in the theory not really the business side so have a think about it speak to your supervisor and um and make sure that you 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 get the worth that you're worth. You've worked hard to get your qualifications. So really, if you're charging for your time, you should get what you're worth. We now find ourselves heading straight in to practice matters. This is the CPD section of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Uh, you can write it down and record it on your CPD tracker to evidence your CPD hours. We always bring in somebody that is a, an expert or we ha speak about a topic that has been uh, deeply researched to be able to bring you information that is maybe applicable to you in your practice. And uh, today, Rory, you met up uh, beautifully introduced, by the way, top of the the, the episode, Rory. But you met up with uh, 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 Sassy Smith and discussing aphantasia. And it's really interesting. I've met with uh, Sassy myself. I've discussed with her. Uh, my eyes were really, really open to such mm. an extent that through discussions within our family, my daughter, who is neurodivergent, uh, when she heard about aphantasia, said, but that's how it is for me. And I think that these topics being discussed open doors, even to uh, qualified professionals where, where, where we've studied, there's so much, there's such a deep mine of learning if we listen to what experts and others that have experience have to say, Rory. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, we the, it's becoming apparent there's been a hidden client group that is emerging the neurodivergent client group and we have to understand you know the aspects of neurodivergency so i spoke to sassy smith who talked about aphantasia or aphantasia depending if you're american or the, in the uk and this is what she had to say practice matters is proudly sponsored by the counselor cpd library to access top quality, relevant continuing professional development for your practice that you can do at a time that suits you and all for less than the price of a cup of coffee, visit counsellingtutor.com. One of the pleasures about being an interviewer on the Counselling Tutor podcast is you come across really interesting people that can really bring valuable information to the world of counselling and psychotherapy. Information you may not be aware of and actually may come from a different discipline. I'm joined today by Sassy Smith. She's the founder of the Amphantasia Coaching Academy and is a prominent voice for neurodiversity in coaching with an expertise in Anfantasia Arolier, I think, and Alexithemia and SDAM. She offers a unique perspective on coaching clients with these conditions. And I think it's fair to say it's been influenced by your own personal journey. So Sassy Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Yes. And the reason I'm so excited to be interviewing you is that there's a that there's a growth and an awareness within, I think, both the counselling and the coaching professions of neurodiversity. And sometimes mm. the traditional tools that we've relied on for, <laughs> I'm going to say millennia, but for a long time, don't work. And in one of those cases, it's a condition called a fantasia. So yes. do you want to just share with me what aphantasia is? Yes. So aphantasia is the inability to create mental images on demand. So it means that 
we can't visualize. So those of us that have these conditions can't visualize. And and the on-demand bit is key because people with aphantasia have the ability to dream very visually. And um, for some people like me who have it, we're able to access our imagery at the point of just about to fall asleep. So in a hypnagogic state or when we're waking up. So in a hypnopompic state. But but consciously, we can't create mental images. And so anything relating to visualising, seeing things, the future, ourselves in a different place, in a different future, is not possible for people with aphantasia. Yes, and I think this is particularly pertinent. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. I think it's particularly pertinent for those therapists who do things like guided imagery, who do things like mindfulness, which relies on the ability of the client to be able to visualise either an existing image within the mind or, or a developing image, something they'd like to be in. And yeah. if we're not aware of it, if we're not aware of that, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people listening to this scribbling down on Fantasia now, <laughs> is that, I hope so, is that you know a client may not get a great value from either in your case coaching or in my case therapy they may feel that they've wasted their time and in fact their money yeah absolutely and that and that was how i felt um i mean i should say that that um if anybody listening to this hasn't heard of aphantasia don't don't beat yourself up about it it, it only got its name in 2015 um, the inability to to visualize was first written about in 1880 by Sir Francis Galton, but but it kind of nothing happened with it, um, and so it was only in 2015 with um, when Professor Adam Zeman um, started writing about it, and in fact gave it its name, that it that it's becoming into pros- into prominence, and that was when I discovered that I had it, um, and I've had it all my life, but I never really could understand why traditional guided meditations or or you know future visualizations didn't work for me um and quite yeah as you said would think i just wasted my money um that the the person i was working with just wasn't any good at, at, at what they did um and um and and one of the one of the saddest things that um i know that i did and that others like me uh, have said that they did is I just went along with it. I didn't get anything from it, but I just went along with it. And that's um, that's not very good in either a coaching or a therapeutic relationship. Um, if you're not, not really getting anything from it and you're just there to be there. Yes, I think that's really interesting. And, and I think it's something that sometimes we may not be aware of that, that, that clients may very well just go with the flow because you don't want to offend yeah. the therapist or they don't yeah. want to feel embarrassed. Um, yeah. I mean, I can, I can imagine that, you know, having to disclose that for some people, they may feel uh, very othered, very different. Um, mm-hmm. So they just go along with it, nod, oh, yes, yeah, make something up maybe. And really they've yeah. come away with nothing. And and if you haven't heard of Anne Fantasia, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link into the show notes of this interview. So if you go to counsellingtutor.com slash podcasts, go to episode 281, you'll be able to go into that page and you'll be able to pick up all the information within the show notes that Sassy has kindly, um, kindly supplied. So I guess that leads me on to thinking, well, if, if guided imagery doesn't work, Mm. And, and you're trying to get someone to reframe their their view mm. of the world. What other ways are there? Or is it a case of, well, that road is pretty much dead-ended? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the client. So I think one of the things that's really important is that lots of people have have aphantasia um and uh just just to sort of clarify the the how it said so uh, there is an a, what i consider to be a more americanized version of it which is aphantasia oh, right. and lots of people so if you hear aphantasia aphantasia it's lots of different ways of saying it um and um but but lots of people who have it won't know that they had it like i said i didn't know until 2015 when I read the article about um, Professor Adam Zeman um, actually naming it. And it's not yet 
widely enough known about that everybody understands and knows that they have it. And so there is a very large potential that people listening will be working with clients who have it but don't know that they have it. Mm. And so it's important to explain what happens for somebody who can't visualise when they don't know that they can't visualise. Yes. So whenever I was was doing a guided visualisation and um, and it would be talking about, you know, say, for example, I was doing one for anxiety and it was about seeing myself at a calm place. So, for example, at the beach or by a lake. Now, I I know what a beach is. I live by the seaside, so I, I, I know what a beach is and I have a concept of a beach. So whenever it came to a point of any guided vis- visualization, I I know what a beach is. I have a concept of a beach. I can think about a beach, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't visualize it. I couldn't imagine myself, place myself at a beach. And so that would be, that was very confusing and very frustrating. So I think when you're working with somebody, it's very important to understand whether or not they can visualize. And, and um, often what I hear, have heard from feedback is that this, um, well, I'm sure if you, if you just try harder, you'll, you'll manage it because everybody can, there is still a, a, a belief that everybody can visualize. And I think this is part of why I talk about it to try and kind of break that myth the bust that myth um so if somebody can't visualize then i would imagine that there will be lots of people listening to this who would say well okay well i'll go to some other modality maybe i'll go to feelings so can you feel the how how you would want to feel and for some people who have a fantasia the ability to feel is also limited. Mm. And there is something around being able to um, create a visual image in your mind of your loved one and experience those wonderful feelings that go with it. And I often say to people that I I imagine that we have this, um, this bucket, this emotion bucket. And every time somebody creates this wonderful visual, they top up their bucket or they have uh the the, you know they step into a memory they they top up their bucket but i can't do that i can't step into my memories that's a that's another uh, uh, another thing that's severely deficient autobiographical memory which uh most of the people i think sorry most is a is a bit high but um the majority of people with uh SDAM also have aphantasia, but not everybody with aphantasia has SDAM. So, but but for the for a lot of people with aphantasia, we also can't access our our memories. And so you start to you start to create this situation where uh, actually you're you're cutting off all of those other modalities that somebody a therapist might use to try to to support to support somebody. The key really is to understand, does the client have aphantasia? And if they do, then exploring, do they have any of these other other conditions? So anorelia is not having an inner monologue. Um, and so I, I also don't have an inner monologue. So I, I don't have that, that very vocal stream of consciousness that might be heavily criticizing me every time I want to mm. try and do something and I don't, don't do it. Um, and so it's important then to understand, you know, what, what, what is available <laughs> to to support a change um and that will depend on the client just to kind of give you an example of one thing that that i think is is very helpful uh is my memories are stories so i can't access and i can't step into any of my memories so all I ever remember is the stories. And I am very, very lucky that my mum tells these wonderful stories of me as a child. And I don't, there aren't any negative stories of me as a child. And I'm incredibly blessed mm. because I've lived my life with these wonderful stories. But stories is how I how I live my memories. 
And so things like narrative therapy are, are potentially more helpful for me if you were dealing with somebody like me who needed to uh, to challenge a story, create a new story, to to take me through a therapeutic process. So that's that's something if you discovered that somebody can't visualize is to, to, to gauge what their memories are like and whether or not you can do some work around around that sort of narrative therapy and changing changing stories. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course, narrative therapy is a, is a postmodern approach, postmodern being that it doesn't refer to any of the ideas historically and the historic development of of counselling and psychotherapy, it it, yeah. it it tells it it tells its own story. I'm sorry to to use the pun. It kind of tells its own story, and it encourages yeah. clients to tell their own story. So what went my what went through my mind is that you probably won't be able to see the film of Sassy, but you can probably get a narration of the book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely, and that and that's and, and going back to the not being able to to hear my stream of consciousness. Of course, just getting me talking and allowing me to just keep talking is probably the best way for for you as as you know my my counselor to get an idea of what's actually going on yeah, yeah. because and that's what that's I'm more likely to externalize my stream of consciousness um than 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 it be internalized and me be able to tell you what it is that I'm thinking uh it's not that I. It's not that I don't think. Obviously, <laughs> yes, quite. I'm quite lucky in that. Although I don't, I don't have an internal monologue. So that that kind of stream of consciousness that I'm not in control of. I do have internal dialogue. I I have the ability to have a conversation with myself. Yes, and that's all very much you know it, it, critical thinking, prefrontal cortex stuff. Um, but what I don't have access to is is that you know. The inner world, I guess. The of, of yeah. it, it, it's happening. It's there. It goes on, and I know it goes on because I I I can feel it in my body when my brain is spiraling, when it's ruminating over over something that I can't access. Absolutely, so it, and and I guess that certain therapies may not suit um, someone with. A fantasia to use the American. I'm, I'm, I come from the north of England, so we massacre vowels as a <laughs> as a standard thing. We just chop the top off like you would do with your egg. Chop the top off vowels, and um, and with with a with, with a fantasia, I'm struggling with this. Um, I, I guess that with with therapies like CBT, they'd look for the auto or the, what's called a NATS, the negative automatic thoughts. Yeah, and and that would be an example, wouldn't it, of um, an in, internal, um, an internal monologue where where they where they just it was just a stream of consciousness. So yeah. again, that might not be very useful. One of the things that also um, kind of piqued my interest a lot was that in traditional uh, training in trauma, trauma therapists are also always taught that if you've got a child who can't or an adult who can't remember their childhood. Then mm. there may be a high degree of certainty that it's possible that they've been abused, and what's happening is is that memory hasn't been laid down. So, from my yeah. conversation with you, I think it's I think you have to tread very carefully with that that kind of line of thinking, because Absolutely. you could go down you could go down a completely different road with the client. So you can't. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting actually because I when I started researching this. So when I started with 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 aphantasia and that kind of led me down all the other uh, as, often associated conditions. And I when I started reading about SDAM, it was interesting that um, so Endel Tulving in 1972 said that that he thought that there would be perfectly healthy people who had not experienced any trauma but who would not be able to uh, access their episodic memory. Yeah. And he said, but we haven't met them yet. Oh. And of course, yeah. So that was 1972. And of course, we, we've been there. We just didn't know. And, and, uh, and I think that just assuming that somebody can't access their childhood memories because there's a trauma block is, 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 is something that we do need to start thinking about challenging. 
And again, that first that first step would be, I wonder if this person can visualize because there may be a link there. Yes. Um, it's it's about how the memories are, are recovered and about not having that visual aspect to be able to bring the memory forward that I that I think is the is is what the the science is saying. It's probably a very a technical term for it um <laughs> but, oh, the prob- the, there probably is and there's probably a, another <laughs> word i can't pronounce properly um but but it, I, I think i think that's just the value of this conversation the, the, mm. there'll be there'll be you know the listener i'm hoping that the, the listener listening will will be able to appreciate now that you know human beings in traditional psychology i think we're, we're kind of we're kind of lumped together, you know. You, you know, people will do this. We are now finding that, of course, we are individuals, and, and neurodiversity brings that another aspect to to being an individual. Uh, and you know, the the more we know, I guess, the more we know, the more we can better serve our clients. And of course, I guess it opens the the other question: that if you have someone who presents with aphantasia <laughs> then almost certainly there, there could be a link to maybe a, a, a form of neurodiversity such as um, being on the autistic spectrum or ADHD or something like that so it's a bit of a clue and it's a door opener isn't it yeah absolutely and I and and, and actually sort of you know the other way around if you have somebody who has ADD ADHD um, then, then you know that's that. Also, start thinking about those questions about what else, where else are those limitations? Same with with autism. Um, I, I think it's important to to understand um, for the listeners about about. I hate, I hate to say it like this, but I don't know any other way to do it. How you get Avantasia. <laughs> Um because there can be some people like me who were born with it. Now, the reason I'm pretty convinced I was born with it was because I cannot ever remember a time when I could visualise. But you can lose the ability to visualise. And we know as we get older, that ability kind of wanes anyway. But you can lose it um, as a result of trauma um, through dissociation, but also from a physical trauma Mm. point of view uh, relating to, to the brain. And um, and I think that's quite important to to know because people who were born with it are more likely to have adapted mm. without even realizing through their lives, and therefore it it hasn't particularly held them back in any way. Well, we don't think it has. Um, there's no there's not so much studies uh, around that yet. I I think it's probably challenging. More challenging for children who are learning now because learning styles have changed yeah. to take on a more visual uh, approach which didn't happen in, when i was learning so whether it's affecting children now i don't know but there are, are other there are other areas where potentially it could the one thing that i struggle with is knowing that when i lose somebody from my life through death that I can never see their face again in my head. I will never hear their voice again. And pretty soon I will have lost all memory of anything we ever did together because I won't be able to access that unless there is a story relating to that. And I think that for me is a is a good, good example of where there potentially it is something more challenging. Uh, I have read lots of um, of uh, anecdotal comments from people saying that they um, they they felt a lot of guilt and shame around grief, around the fact that they didn't seem to be experiencing grief in the same way as everybody else was. Mm. And you know, people might be seeing them as a bit cold because they were able to move on so quickly. And it's not a case of us moving on more quickly. It's just that we just we've lost them they've gone yes and that's and that's quite challenging i think it for is me. it's, it's yes. the only thing that i feel very very um challenged by yeah can, uh, I, can, I take lots of photos and lots of videos and yes. you know all those kind of things but yeah i i, I hear that and, and again 
from a you know from a client's perspective they may feel othered or uh, you know a little weird if mm. if that doesn't happen it's it, you know and it, almost certainly there'll be a conversation with maybe relatives or or their friends where people say oh, you're a bit weird you know how, how does that work and mm. um, and we have to be guarded against that i have to say this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation you've opened the word the world to to you've opened the world to um i guess a way of being that sometimes is missed or or is just not discussed and i'm so grateful that you've that you've joined us so sassy smith thank you so much for joining us Big thank you to Sassy Smith. Big thank you to you, Roy, for reaching out, holding those interviews, bringing us the good stuff, as I call it. <laughs> this is Counselling okay. Tutor Podcast. You joined us at episode 281. Yes, we started off with student services. We talked about back to basics, counselling fundamentals, making sure you've got those essential ingredients uh, to um, su- support and sustain your counselling session with the person that you're working with with moving on to esp or ethical sustainable practice we talked about cancellations and no-show policies making sure that you can secure your income even if the client doesn't uh, appear at your door and then finally practice matters sassy smith discussing aphantasia the inability not to visualize uh, what a great what, what a great interview and what really really good information And before we close out today's episode, I've got a couple of quick favours to ask you, the listener. First, if you've enjoyed and benefited from our conversation today, please leave us a five-star review on whichever platform you're tuning in from. It generally helps us reach more ears and grow our community. And secondly, if someone in your circle might benefit from our discussions, share the episode on your social media platforms. Word of mouth is so powerful and we appreciate every share, tweet or X as it is now, or post that brings in new listeners to our community. Thank you so much for being such a vital part of ours and I guess your journey. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode by visiting counsellingtutor.com dot com.